People are already saying hi. Here comes Norm, guys. <laughs> Hello. Sorry to bum you out. It's just me. Hi, everybody. This you is all for the love it. of Tom Petty. And uh, I hope you guys are Tom Petty fans. You can read, right, Norm? People are I just saying. I can't see that well. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to have to be my translator. No, yeah, I will. Good evening from England. Yeah. <laughs> but we love He's you. He's here. Michael's here. The best gu guitar store in the world. Thank you. We love you guys. I appreciate it. You can read people. Say you see it, Norm? Yep. Everybody's saying. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate it. The love we get is we don't deserve as much as we get, but we really love you guys. And uh, I hope you're all well, because, I mean, it's a scary time out there. I've got my mask. I've got my gloves. I hope you guys are doing the same thing. And please be careful. You know, we want, we want to have you guys, once we can reopen in full force, we want to see you guys in person. And uh, you know, I always look forward to that. And the interaction that we get, you know, when you guys come in from all over, um, you know, we love it. So uh, I don't think any store gets as much love as we do. And, and I really do appreciate it. So Jen is going to uh, kind of interpret for me because... Uh, Tell, them we're... Tell them why we're going live right now. Uh, so we're going live because um, my friend John Scott wrote a book called Tom Petty and Me. And it's a great book. If you're a Tom Petty fan, you guys may never would have even known who Tom Petty was if it wasn't for John Scott. John Scott worked for MCA Records for a while and then he worked for ABC. And when um, Tom went over to ABC, um, the record came out, his first record, and there was a picture of him wearing uh, this jacket with like these bullets, this leather jacket. And the record company kind of dismissed the band as being a punk band. And the record did not do well in the very beginning. The first eight months, the record company was ready to drop the record completely. They didn't even want to promote it anymore. Generally, a record has a certain amount of time. If it doesn't click immediately, what ends up happening is it gets shelved and they go on to the next one. And uh, when John comes on, I'm going to have him uh, tell you a little bit about it. But what happened was John got hired by ABC and he went into an office that they gave him and uh, there just happened to be a, a record in a blank case sitting there and John the first record he put on when he got the job he puts it on with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and he heard Breakdown and he just flipped and then he heard some of the other tunes and kind of just went nuts that it was great then he said I hope this band can do live what they do on record so he went out to see him just so happened they were playing one of the next nights at the whiskey and he went to see them and he was blown away and John single-handedly championed the band and what he did was he went to the radio stations and he got it played where nobody was playing it it was dead meat the stuff was just sitting there no what ended up happening was uh it was forgotten and gone and john single-handedly came up with record promotions and all kinds of stuff um, and he actually went out on tour with the band uh, you know, and kind of went to the radio stations and made sure that they played the uh, the record and uh, has a lot of history with Tom and he goes back about as far as I do with Tom. So, um, uh, so anyhow, is John, uh, is John there John's yet? John's coming. All right, John will be here momentarily and the book is called Tom Petty and Me and I read it two times. It's a very easy, quick read. It's a lot of fun. And it just lets you know that there's a lot of bands, if the record companies don't give them support right off the bat, what ends up happening is a band either starves to death or they break up and each one goes into some other band or whatever, or takes a day gig or any way that they can kind of pay their bills. So um, this was kind of a miraculous recovery for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And if it wasn't for Tom, maybe you guys wouldn't even know who they were. Um, by the way, for you Tom Petty fans, this is something that I have that's very dear to me that Tom gave me. This is his top hat that he wore when he was out with Bob Dylan. And Tom signed it inside. And it's a prized piece of memorabilia that I have. 
Can you wear it, Norm? I could wear it, but it looks a lot better, or looked a lot better on Tom. All right, quit laughing, you guys. I know you. <laughs> Say, when did you first open your guitar store? I opened my first store in 1975. And I was kind of buying and selling guitars out of uh, an apartment that I had in Sherman Oaks. And uh, Tom was definitely uh, one of my earlier customers. And that was due to Ron Blair, um, who I played in a band with for about a year prior to him being in the Heartbreakers. I played Hammond organ and Ron, of course, played bass. Ron's a good guitar player and songwriter and singer, too. So we're trying to see if we can get John on here. So What's that, your favorite guitar you personally own? Oh, there's so many of them. I love a lot of them. Um, there's a Blonde Dot Neck ES335 that I love. I mean, there's some great acoustics that I have. Um, Martin, pre-war Martins. Um, you know, a couple really cool Rickenbackers. There's a Rickenbacker in the back I can get and show you guys in a little bit. That's pretty cool as well. Um, go uh, grab it, Norm. Go grab all it. All right, I'll go grab it. Lemo, what? come say hi real quick. People are saying. Who is it? Just the world. The world? Da 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 da. <laughs> Norm. Look at this guy. Look at this. Whoa. Get your hair out of your face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there, show it, Norm. Okay, so I'm sure Tom would really like this guitar. This is a one-of-a-kind Rickenbacker. It's a combination 381-330. It doesn't have the binding, and it's got the points like the 330, but it's got the arch top. I don't know if you can see this. Um, it's raised like a 381, like the John K model. Um, you know, the regular 330s are completely flat across the top. So it's, uh, this is a 68 in fire glow in really nice shape. And uh, I believe it's a one of a kind. It's, it's definitely one of the coolest guitars. Toaster pickups, you know, beautiful fire glow finish. Um, this was either experimental and maybe they made one or maybe they made a few of them and then never really went into production with this model exactly. So it has features of both the 381 and the 330 and it is mono, so it's only got the one input jack there. It's not a stereo guitar. So, uh, but a very, very cool guitar. And uh, Tom bought a lot of Rickenbackers from me over the years, one being the one uh, 360 double bound Rose Morris uh, that he had with the F hole. The Rose Morris was uh, the distributor in England of a lot of the uh, Rickenbacker guitars. And one thing that they did to kind of differentiate those guitars is instead of having the uh, cat's eye hole, it would have like a, an F hole, like a regular arch top would have. And those guitars are very unusual. They so, said that did you sell any guitars to Bob Dylan? I've sold a number of guitars to Bob over the years. And uh, yeah. Um, one of my first customers was Robbie Robertson from the band. And I was living in a little apartment in Sherman Oaks and I had guitars all over the place. This was before I had a store. And I had an ad in the LA Times and I listed a number of instruments that I had. And uh, so Robbie uh, called about the ad and he didn't even identify himself. And I didn't know what he looked like. To be honest, I was I'm a fan of the John band, him. but I didn't really know what Robbie looked like. And so what ended up happening was he came in, saw all these guitars, and he ended up buying a few guitars from me. And then he said, would you mind if uh, I bring a friend over? And I said, no, I don't really care. Because there was no stores, there were no stores in LA that really specialized in vintage guitars at the time. So um, uh, he came in and he brought Bob Dylan. And Bob ended up buying a number of guitars from me. And he also went to my warehouse where I had a bunch of other guitars. And um, the following week, Robbie ended up bringing Joni Mitchell in as well. And he also hooked me up to supply all the instruments to the last waltz when they were doing that. You know, one funny story, I was talking to uh, John about this, John Scott. Um, when Bob came over, um, he bought a couple guitars that I had in my apartment. And he asked about a few other guitars. I said, well, I've got some other guitars in a warehouse. 
um, would you like to come? And he said, yeah, can I do it like in a couple of days? And I said, fine. He came over and picked me up and he had an old Cadillac and it had like a vinyl top. And it was kind of a funky looking car. It really, you know, didn't look like anybody wealthy would be driving this car. And I'm in the car with Bob and he's uh, driving and I'm in the passenger seat and he had a Mastiff dog. It was this giant dog with a head that was gigantic, must have been 200 pound dog. And the dog was like drooling over both of us you know, as we were speaking. And we pulled up to a red light and this couple pulled up next to us. And uh, the guy started pointing over and he was going, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan. And then he looked at the car and went, couldn't possibly be in that crappy car. So it was just kind of a story that, uh, you know, we're in the car, this dog's drooling on us. These people pull up to us and when they saw the car, they just figured it couldn't be Bob. And Bob kind of uh, was, you know, kind of low profile. I mean, he didn't always drive the fanciest cars and stuff like that. There's and John. I see my buddy John over there. Hey. John, how you doing? Hey, He's Norm. with us. All I'm right. so happy to be with a man known as a Norm's Rare Guitar. He, he, Tom Petty talks so much about you and Mike Campbell. Aww. Well, those guys are my buddies and, uh, you know, I love Tom and still love Mike and Mike's still doing it. You know, he was yes, out in Fleetwood Mac and now he's doing the Dirty Knobs and look out for them, man, because they are really good. And my buddy oh, they are good. Today, Jason Sine is playing with him, who's a great guitar player. Oh, that's cool. I got my guys here with me. All right. That's really cool. So tell us a little bit about the story. Tell the people about what a Shut record promo man does. And if you have a copy of your book, maybe you could kind of hold it up. And show. But tell the people, because a lot of people don't realize that um, if it wasn't for the promotion departments and the record companies, you wouldn't know about these guys. Because if the record doesn't get played and it gets no airplay and the record company is not behind it, it just kind of disappears. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, sometimes I, I, I think fans go, how does a band get from here to, a, you know, 100? And sometimes it just takes a little push. But, you know, sometimes 30 seconds of somebody listening to your record and they don't like it, they'll toss it. And sometimes they look at the picture on the cover and they may not <laughs> like it and they don't play it, right? Which is uh, that picture right there. Yep. He's wearing that leather coat with the bullets. I don't know if that was a guitar strap or that was part of the coat, you know, so. You know. They, th they thought of him as a punk act. They did think he was a punk act. And when I, when I first picked up the record, I picked it up in a jacket like this, a white album jacket. I had nothing about Tom on there. And it fell out of my closet. And when I was there, I was at ABC Records as head of album promotion for three days. And this album comes tumbling down. And I go, you know, I got to listen to this record like you. We're music nuts. And so I sit down and listen. And the first song comes on, Rocking Around With You. And I'm looking at it going, I'm shaking my head. Oh, good. And I hear a breakdown. And man, I am just over the moon. When I hear a breakdown, I'm going, holy mackerel. Who, is the, who are these guys? And then, of course, I, you know, the album ends with American Girl, one of the greatest songs ever. And I am literally, Norm, in a trance, as you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you're a music lover, so you get it. You know, yeah. You're a guitar and, music kind of guy. So, Well, I can't play an instrument, but that's okay. I can listen. And who, who at the record company, who did the record company want you to promote instead of Tom Petty and Heartbreaker? <laughs> well, well my boss, Charlie Miner, was telling promotion guys to promote um, Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis. Billy Davis forget Davis. about that guy, Tom Petty. He's a punk band. Uh -huh. And so the record had been out for eight months. And like I said, I just, you know, I don't think it was, I think it was meant to happen that the black album fell down out of my closet and something said, sit down and listen to it. Serendipity so, right there. It's very serendipity. My whole book, I think, is a lot of serendipity going on in the book. And um, I ran to my boss, like, who are these guys? He, he put the record on the turntable and said, oh, that's that punk band, Tom Petty and the Heart Records. We've been, uh, the record's been out for eight months and we're going to drop them. I'm like, well, well, you said punk band? Did you? It's a rock and roll band. He said, no, it's a punk band. I'm like, 
Charlie, have you ever listened to this record? It's a rock no. and roll record. As a matter of fact, one of the best rock albums I had heard in years. So I begged him to give me six weeks to try and get records played on the radio. That's my job as a national head of album promotion. So I just said, please give me six weeks. That's all I'll ask. If I don't do it, I'll quit. So they didn't uh, believe it, right? They, well, uh, no, he said, <laughs> he said, uh, look, this is an unbankable punk band. I, I go, why do you keep, getting, keep saying punk? He said, well, look at the cover. Yeah, he's got a black leather jacket on, bullets around his neck. That's what radio stations are telling us. It's a punk band. Well, first and impression I, is, a, is a lot, and people make up their minds sometimes way too soon. Um, it's, it's so sad because some bands, you know, they, you know, they're so good, but they just don't have anybody behind them pushing. And uh, they can have the greatest record in the world and never be heard. And you came up with certain promotions for them, you know, with the radio stations. Didn't you do something where you got the radio, the record company to back them playing uh, for free for these uh, radio stations that you had set up? Um, so just as an introduction, and, you know, it's hard for the, uh, you know, radio stations to get these groups to come in and do a special guest thing. And it's a free mm -hmm. promo for the radio station. Right. We came up with that idea, right? Well, yes, we uh, we started getting a little bit of airplay, and the only way we could get the band in front of uh, a rock audience is to book them. They call them low dough concerts. Like if your station was a dollar one hundred three on the dial, we would play for a dollar and three cents, and the record company backed that. And we did about 20 of those. They're doing that right now. They're doing concerts for a dollar three right now, aren't they? <laughs> well, I actually, they're not doing concerts, but I think those days are long gone. I think we, I just can't wait till live concerts start again because I love music. And but uh, yeah, we had to do a dollar three concerts. If you find a t well, there's, there's a ticket stub inside my book that shows we played for a dollar three in Memphis because you couldn't get on an existing tour. You know that we—that was impossible as, a, as an opening act. So we well, just record companies would have to, you know, kind of subsidize that, right? Exactly, and they didn't want to do that. But um, yeah, they—I uh, think it was Lee Abrams who agreed to give us twenty stations. We played twenty stations for a dollar three. And there were a few um, stations that were playing Tom in the beginning. What one in Boston, right? Boston. And San Francisco, San Francisco, San Jose, Hello Paul, Lobster Wells, uh, yeah. Chicago too, Norm Weiner, Bonnie Simmons at KSAN in San Francisco. She was a tremendous. But those tough. were just the very few that were actually playing Tom Petty, right? That's true. And the record sold 12,000 copies in eight months. And um, I just decided to go on a one man mission with the help of my ABC promo guys to let the world know who Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were. Yep. Because when the DJs went into the scene live, they came out. Hours of singing along to every song the Tom does. And um, so when the DJs came out of the concert, it was like, whoa, they got, we got to start playing this record. And that's what happened. Um, people just you know, started... it's funny when I, uh, you know, I told you the story where, you know, I played with Ron Blair for about a year prior to uh, our band broke up. I went with a guy named Rick Vito, who's a great guitar player. We had right. a band the Angel City Rhythm Band, and Ron went with Tom. And um, when I was playing, the, the band that Ron and I played with was called the Charlie Dog Band. And uh -huh. it was named after the guitar player's dog. And we had a gig at this funky biker bar uh, called the Rock Corporation off of Van Nuys Boulevard in Sherman Oaks. And Hulk Hogan used to go there and all his biker movies <laughs> and all that. You know, and it was a funky, it was not a great gig, but it was a gig. And um, so when we formed the Angel City Rhythm Band with Rick Vito, we immediately got hired at the Rock Corporation and it was our um, our steady gig and we played there for weeks on end. And, you know, in those days, it wasn't like you played one set and that was it. It right. was like four or five sets a night. And it was a good yeah. way for a band to kind of get 
their act together and develop their material and all that. Right. So Ron and Tom called me and said, hey, man, can you call me? You know, you're friends with the owner of the Rock Corporation. See if you can get us a gig there. And I did. And I think that's one of the reasons why Tom was always, um, you know, he never turned me down if I asked him to do anything, if I asked him to do oh, a video at the store or you. do, you know, uh, this show for the Midnight Mission. Tom was, he never turned me down. He was always great to me. And I think he just remembered that when they needed a gig and nobody was hiring them, they were not, you know, wasn't easy to get a gig. And plus, back in those days, the club owners wanted you to play all covers. That oh, was yeah. the way they knew they were going to fill a club. So yes. they really, there were very few clubs that you could play where you could play original music and the club owners were kind of open to that. So um, when I recommended them, they got the gig, they loved them there. And they were doing, they didn't have a lot of their own tunes at that time. Right. They were doing like Stones cover tunes and, um, you know, uh, all kinds well, of other early rock and roll tunes, you know. Well, like you know, the, Tom and them the were probably considered one of the greatest cover bands there are. Absolutely. They can take a song like Oh Carol by Chuck Berry and they made it their own. Uh -huh. And boy, I love the, co they, the cover songs they used to do just knock me out. But anyway, so, so Ron was with you and then he left. Yeah, so, yeah, and then one day I'm driving in the car and American Girl comes on and the guy, the DJ goes, and that's Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And I go, holy shit these guys are on the radio you know because i mean you know it's hard to believe because i mean these guys couldn't even get a gig you know right now they're being played on the rock stations they were repeating and playing the tune over and over again oh yeah so um they were you know all of a sudden they were starting to happen and people were kind of shaking their head going i know those guys <laughs> yeah the um you know tom used to tell me they'd go to europe and then you know they had some success in europe Mm -hmm. And Tom would tell me when he got home, he'd feel like nobody. Yeah, they had great reviews in Europe, and then they came back, and they were just another bar band around here. Exactly. Well, and what happened is I, I played the record for a friend of mine at K-West, a new radio station that was competing with KMET in Los Angeles. And he heard it and flipped out. And I told him, he asked me, are they any good live? I said, Charlie, I don't know. I just picked up this white album jacket three days ago. But I do know they're opening for Blondie this coming Saturday night. So we hightailed it to the to the Whiskey A Go Go, and uh, there was about ten fifteen people in the Whiskey at that time because Tom was the seven o'clock opening act. I mean, can you imagine Tom opening for didn't, Blondie? Didn't Tom throw you out? Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, I mean, you know, he, he was not like a great lover of the record company, especially of ABC when they let the record just kind of sit on the shelf and just ready yeah. to give up on it. And you told them you were going to get it played and all this stuff. And he said, yeah, sure. Out of here. Yeah, well, the band, I, I went upstairs after seeing the show because I was knocked out. And so was my DJ buddy. And I went up there and introduced myself to Tom. I said, hi, Tom. I'm the new head of album promotion for ABC Records. And everybody started laughing. Tom said, you know, we hate ABC Records. They've done nothing for us for eight months. Like they've advertised this in teen magazine and punk magazines. And, and so just get out of here. You're just another ABC nut job. Yeah. I said, no, no, no. Tom, have you heard your record on the radio in Los Angeles? And he went, no, why? I said, well, you're gonna start hearing it Monday morning once an hour, every hour on K West on in Los Angeles. And he looked at me and just sh shook his head and do me a favor, get out of here. <laughs> and but, you know, I understood he had been beat up by the record company. Oh yeah. Months, right. So <clears throat> as I'm leaving, I, I just turned around for some reason. I said, Tom Petty, I'm gonna just break your career. How's that? Oh my God. He said, fine. But get out of here. No, he didn't <laughs> say fine. He said, get the F out of here. Because <laughs> you can't, you, you know, nobody from ABC is bringing, uh, they've made promises, but nothing's happened. Right. And I think Bugs kind of told me to come on out and leave. And then I just turned By the way, around. Bugs was Tom's right hand man who uh, was with him all the time. Bugs spent probably more time with him than Tom's wife spent with him. You know? <laughs> I love Bugs, Alan Bugs. Like Great you know. guy. Yep. Uh, anyways, but right before he threw me out, I turned around to him. I'm not sure why I did this. But I said, Tom Petty, my name is John Scott. 
every time you hear your record on the radio, you are going to think of me. And boy, he let some expletives fly like, sure, you know. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so Charlie and I walked out and, um, and Charlie started playing it Monday morning. And on Wednesday, Tower Records called Charlie, uh, Charlie at K West and said, hey, who's this band you're playing? People are calling, wanting to know who they are. And, and they ordered 250 copies of the first album. And of course, people at ABC Records were going, hey, this is eight months old, what are you doing? Then on Friday, I get a phone call. My assistant said, Tom Betty's on the phone. I went, oh boy, he's either going to let you have it now. <laughs> let me have it again. And so, you know, Tom and his um, Southern drawl, like I'm from Memphis, he's from Florida. He yeah. goes, hey, John, um, this is Tom Petty. And I just want to ask you a question. Are you serious about what you said about breaking my career? I said, Tom, I am so serious. I'm going to do it. And he said, I just want to apologize for throwing you out of the whiskey the other night. <laughs> because my friends are telling me they've heard the record on the radio. Then he said, can you come over to my house tonight? And I wrote down the address so quick because at that point, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were my favorite band. I couldn't get them off from my turntable or home. Hey, or he probably needed direction because there was no navigation. I just want to cut in and say one thing. Sure. We've had people say hi from Saudi Arabia, Dubai, uh, Nigeria, uh, Brazil, uh, Germany. I mean, again, hi to all you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching this. And uh, well, you're a Tom Petty fan, um, you know, I hope you get something out of this because, again, you wouldn't know Tom Petty if it wasn't for John Scott. Thank you, Norm. Well, anyway, so I met Tom at his house, and um, he had a Confederate flag on the wall when you walked in. Of course, you know, later on, that became an issue with both of us, but we didn't know the, any better at the time. And uh, we, we went outside and bonded that night. Uh, because I had worked at MCA Records. And Let I, me just ask you, because sure. I know Tom, and yeah. you know Tom, how yeah. did you bond? Well, we went outside and smoked a peace pipe. Yeah, there you go. That's that's <laughs> part of it right there. So I mean, you know, he was angry at me when I got to his house. Yeah. He Tom wasn't a choir boy, let's just say. No, I mean, you know, it was the 70s, Norm, right? Yeah. And uh, he said, let's go smoke a peace pipe, because I threw you out of the whiskey. Let's go uh -huh. smoke a peace pipe outside. And so we did. And that's when we bonded because I knew the band Mud Crutch. And he went, how do you know Mud Crutch? I went, well, I worked at MCA Records and they, you had a song called Depot Street that I was promoting and I got it played. He said, it I'm only free, got, right? yeah, he said it only got played in three stations. I said, well, I got two of the records added. And so at that point, we kind of looked at each other like, what's going on here? You're telling me you're going to break my career. You know who Mud Crutch is. Nobody knew who Mud Crutch was. What's going on? And we kind of looked at each other like, wow, this is kind of weird. I mean, what are the odds of me? I'm staring in my favorite singer's eyes and, and going, well, this, is, this whole thing is kind of serendipity. And you were you went on tour with them, didn't you, for a long time? As well. I did. You were on the bus with those guys. Oh yeah. I'm sure you got some stories, some that can be told, some that can't be told. You know? No, no. I, you know, the thing about Tom is there were no girls allowed on the bus, and that's one thing I admired about Tom. And you know, you're talking about cover songs. The first concert outside of Los Angeles that I saw him at was in Santa Cruz, California, at a small little gymnasium or auditorium. And it was packed because those people, I guess, listened to um, K-San in San Francisco or K-Pig, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he did six encores that night. And I'm going, I have never seen a band do six encores. And I remember going backstage, people were still clapping. And I went, Tom, they still want you to play more. He said, John, we don't know any more songs. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so then that, that's when I went on the road with them, and my gosh, I had so much fun. I mean, I was looking, I was watching History Made every night. Yeah. Because Tom's motto was, you know, to make every concert better than the last one, and also make every album better than the last one. And well, I think you know, Tom, Tom was serious about the band and the music, and I know they didn't allow girls on the bus, right. but I know some of those other guys, and there were a lot of girls around. 
That's all I can tell you. you know, I mean, Stan yeah. was their dog. Stan used to play volleyball at my house. Ron was not an angel either. And, you know, I, I knew, you know, I knew a few of those guys. So you know, I don't want to say anything, but I don't get the wrong idea. Well, yeah, I never saw that, to be honest with you. Maybe maybe Stanley, maybe, uh, but uh, I won't say Stan, that. Yeah. <laughs> if you're watching Stan Lynch, I love you. Yeah, you love Stan, too. My lips are sealed. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, boy, wow, watching Tom Penny and Heartbreakers play San Francisco was just an unbelievable treat. Yeah. yeah. And we were, we were talking about Mud Crutch before, and, you know, here's just a funny little uh, – thing you know um there used to be a paper out here called the recycler and it was like a you know uh one of those want ad kind of papers where um it came out thursday morning at like 6 30 or 7 in the morning and mm -hmm. um the guys used to line up out there um and we'd get great deals out of that paper and but you have to be first uh, you know first come first serve and all. sure and i that's where i knew tom ledden from uh mud crutch wow. Wow. And Tom would be standing out there looking to buy guitars also, because that was kind of his sideline when he was still out here. Um, and um, what was funny is that I knew I knew Tom Ledden, and Tom Ledden was such a Southern quiet guy. Tom would never go, um, yeah, I worked with Tom Petty. Or, you know, I had no idea that he had any connection with Tom Petty at all. I knew he was Bernie Ledden's brother from the from the Eagles, and I didn't even realize that Bernie actually, you know, was from that area too in Gainesville. And um, so, and Tom never said anything. He used to walk around with like a bottle of water, and uh, we used to think of him as kind of we used to call him like a granola head. You know, one of these guys are, had a bottle of water and he'd just be eating like you know whatever. You know, I'd be dying for a steak and he'd be eating like health food and vegan and you know whatever yeah and he yeah. was just so quiet he just never even mentioned tom really yeah and then i re oh. found out later that he was in mud crutch you know i did not really? know that yeah i, I, I mean I, I just knew who mud crutch was the, the name in 1974 when i worked at mca but i never and when my boss told me to forget about him i said okay i just forgot about him so let me ask you a question. Um, sure. They were with Shelter originally, right? Correct. Was that part of MCA or how, how did that work? It was part of, uh, no, it was part of ABC Records. Uh, in the beginning, ABC distributed Shelter Records. Right, but they were with MCA for a brief time or something? Well, or? When, uh, when MCA came to bought, a bought ABC, uh, that's when Tom didn't want to go to MCA. And... Um, um, so that's when Tom, uh, refused to record an album for MCA because he really had a lousy contract at Shelter Records. Yeah. I, mean, I think Tom would say Denny Cordell, who's a genius, but not a genius in business. And Tom was saying he was making like a penny a record, um, yeah. first album. And, um, but yeah, that it, the, the word distributed by MCA, but first by ABC Records. Uh-huh. And then MCA bought ABC Records, and um, I, I, I decided I didn't want to go over there either. If Tom didn't want to go, I didn't want to go. And so um, that's when the band filed bankruptcy because they didn't want to go to MCA with a crappy contract. Right. When I, when I first knew Tom, um, you know, he would come into the store, and I had like a little 500-square-foot store, mm -hmm. and Ron brought him in. And... Um, you know, he would look at like black guard tellies and stuff, and he really had no money. And he said, man, no. I'd really love to have one of those. And we made him a guitar, a custom made guitar. It looked like a black guard telecaster. Uh -huh. But on the headstock, there was a little like a wreath, like this green thing, and it had an end in the center of that. And I know in the first few years, man, that was probably the guitar he used almost more than anything else. And exactly. then when he finally was able to afford some stuff he came in and bought some really nice guitars for me and all that how many guitars um, do you think he bought from you maybe 70 to 100 i don't know a lot wow. and then you know uh dana sometimes would buy his wife dana would buy a uh, guitar and say you know you know what tom's got what do you think tom would like for his <laughs> birthday or for christmas or something like that and i i had a good idea of 
what Tom liked. I, I saw one time this one hummingbird that was a really rare and very unusual one that had kind of like an L5 fingerboard on it. They made very few of them like that. And I said, well, I know he likes that dove that he used to write a lot of his tunes on. I bet he would like this guitar. So um, I know he bought that. There was a time where he was being interviewed by Vintage Guitar Magazine and uh, they were asking him what kind of custom color stuff he had. And he had a few things at the time, but he came to me and um, he said, you know, I really need to buy some custom color stuff. And prior to that, there was a, a little thing. I think I mentioned this to you before. I was selling, uh, I've done a lot of business with hard rock cafes. And um, oh, yeah. what, what ended up happening was somebody had sold the Hard Rock Cafe a jacket that they claimed was Tom's and they had it on display. And Tony, uh, Tom's manager, Tony Dimitriotis, he uh, said, hey, get that out of here. That's not Tom's. That never was. And it was kind of a bogus <laughs> wow. booth that they had in there. And uh, this friend of mine, Don Bernstein, who was the uh, acquisition guy for the Hard Rock, called right. me and said, hey, man, you know, we're kind of in the doghouse. You know, we had this Tom Petty jacket up and, you know, we got busted for that. You know, can you do anything for Tom, you know, to get us some Tom stuff? And I said, it's funny you mentioned that because Tom just called me and he's asking about custom color guitars. So I called Tom back and I said, hey, man, you want some custom color guitars? Trade me some stuff you're not using anymore with some stage clothes and stuff right. like that. And I'll trade you some cool custom color guitars. So he got a lot of really nice custom colors. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember a beautiful jazz master, white one with gold parts, and there was a bass wow. six and all kinds of stuff. Well, let me ask you, was there one guitar in particular that Tom would bug you about that he wanted? And... Well, the one guitar uh, in my first book, Tom did the forward to my book. Right. And what ended up happening was he spotted this one guitar in there that was a Rickenbacker 360 Rose Morris 12 string. And when he, and it also had a tag, uh, a receipt from Hesse's Music in London. And that's where the Beatles got all their stuff. And this wow. is, Tom wow. was a huge Beatles fan. And he said, I want that guitar. And I said, Tom, it's yours. I'll be happy to sell it to you or trade you, but I'm not ready to let it go yet. And like every three or four months, Tom would call and go, hey, Norm, you know, what about the Rickenbacker? And finally, I said, all right, Tom, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trade you for something that you're not using anymore. Right. That's where I got this, oh, this top hat that oh, yeah. Tom put used it out, put with it on, Bob bro. Dylan. Oh, wow. Side, Look at that. Inside there. Beautiful. And, um, and a Gibson SG standard that was a 1964 or five, I believe it was. Uh -huh. And um, so those are uh, that guitar I had sold him. He traded that back to me with the hat and he got this Rickenbacker. But I said, but what I want you to do is I want, I'm involved with this homeless charity and I really want you to play for this homeless charity. And he asked about it and it's called the Midnight Mission. And when I kind of told him about it and then when he looked into it, he got really involved with it because, uh, you know, yeah. Tom knew that he could have been homeless very easily. If it wasn't for you, maybe he could have been, you know, so um, he, he knew that, you know, he was no better than the next guy. And he, you know, he always had that feeling that, you know, he wanted to help. And he did. He played three times for them, raised almost a million dollars for the Midnight Mission. Wow. And so it was really a cool thing. And well, he did he it with Mud Crutch, by the way. Is that right? Well, yeah. I know he loved you and would do pretty much anything that you would ask because he loved your store. You were always treating him so kind. And uh, well, I remember when it when he didn't have two nickels to rub together. So uh, I do too. Yeah, I, know. I, I definitely do. I remember going over, bringing him a pizza to some apartment. For, right, the first time I met after I met Tom, I went over there and brought a pizza. Man, they were gobbling that thing down like crazy. Yeah. Because they, you know, they didn't have a great contract, and so anyway. But um, you know, all that ended, and uh, ABC put out the second Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers album. You're going to get it, uh -huh. and uh, that was I was so thrilled when that record came out because he had the material to back it up. You know, so it wasn't a one-hit wonder kind of deal. He did well that night that we at his house when we bought it. I, I said, "Do you have any other stuff you want to play?" And he said, "Well, we got a couple of demos. You want to hear them?" I said, "Well, sure." And so I sat down in front of a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and he played "Listen to Her Heart," and Mike Campbell's you know guitar beginning of that song just hooks you in. Yeah, 
Well, Mike yeah. is basically like the George Harrison for that band. Never played the wrong note. Everything he played was perfect. And, Everything you know, perfect. I mean, one of my favorite. Norm guitar. is probably. I mean, uh, Mike to me is one of the greatest guitar players in the world, and he doesn't get the respect that he deserves. But you know, Mike just says, "I just do what I do. I don't care if I'm number one or 80." But I know, and I think you know, he's one of the greatest guitar players in the world. Without a doubt. And by the way, Mud Crush, uh, not Mud Crush, uh, The Dirty Knobs, you got to check them out. They're great. If you love guitar music, that's a guitar band and they're fantastic. Yeah, he just put a new song out. It's great. I love the new song Mike just put out. I think yeah. Jason Sine is putting out a song too. You know Jason. I know Jason very, very, very well. Jason is one of the great guys, one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet, and one of the most regular guys you'd ever want to meet and one of the great guitar players, and he's done a lot for the Midnight Mission. And the Dirty Knobs played for the Midnight Mission several times as well, too. So, is that right? and, and also when they had like this birthday party for Tom, you know, after Tom was gone, um, you know, all a lot of the guys from the Heartbreakers and the Dirty Knobs did stuff uh, for that, and it all went to the Midnight Mission. So all those guys are still behind the Midnight Mission. And that's let me so tell you, right now, with all the stuff that's happening with coronavirus and all that, imagine what it's like to be homeless and right. be living under a bridge or something or in a cardboard box with all that's going on right now. So if you guys love Tom Petty, I mean, if you ever want to make a donation to the Midnight Mission in Los Angeles, I think it's 601 South San Pedro Street, Los Angeles, 90014. Um, do it in Tom's name. Tom would give you a kiss from heaven. Right. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you know, you, you just inspired me right there. And I, I, if anybody buys my book in the next two days, I'm going to make a donation on every book sold to the Midnight Mission just for you. Well, I recommend the book. I really enjoyed the book. I read it two times in, <laughs> uh, in a matter of about three days. I couldn't put it down. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's because I knew Tom and I felt so attached to it, but it was really cool hearing the stories because, um, you know, it wouldn't have happened. Thank you, Norm. I really appreciate that. But, uh, you know, I did it for passion, the music. I didn't do it for the money. Right. I and I think that's the way to do everything. I mean, when I opened my store, I was hoping I was going to make a living. I didn't know if I'd be in business for five years after I opened, but I knew I loved what I did. And so I turned a, a hobby and something I loved into uh, a business. And I think, it, you know, and for all you young guys out there that are looking to do something, do what you love and stick with it. And hopefully the money will come, you know, right. through your so, path. So it comes right from your heart. I know, Norm, I can tell when you read my book twice. Yeah. Uh, the second you call me and, and I could tell you meant what you said from your heart. Absolutely. I really, really appreciate that. So that's what I'm going to do. Next two days, people go to TomPettyMe.com. I will make a donation in your name. And in Tom's name. Do it in Tom's name. I'll do it in Tom's name. Okay. And uh, we'll give it to the Midnight Mission. Fantastic. That's really nice of you, John. And listen, when we, you know, we have done like a lot of uh, podcasts. In fact, Jason Sine did one of the podcasts uh, with me and we had Vince Gill and we had mm -hmm. Angel Zappa and we had, uh, we were getting Richie Sambor, but we haven't gotten him yet, but he's going to do it. Um, uh, Don Peak from the Wrecking Crew, um, just a lot of really great people. Joe Bonamassa has already done it. And we had to kind of take a break because of what's going on right now. But when we get back to it, I really would love it if you would do a podcast with me and we oh. can, you know, reminisce some more about Tom and all that. It would be my pleasure, Norm, because like I said, Tom and Mike constantly talk to me about you and your guitars. I mean, um, the, the well, the sound. people that watch this stuff, I mean, I know they're the Tom Petty fans, but the people that watch any of our videos on YouTube and all that and uh, Instagram, they're guitar lovers. And that's the one thing that brought us all together, these guitars I and mean, the love yeah. for a guitar. And the thing that's cool about a guitar and, you know, people say, well, why did you pick guitar? Because I was mainly a keyboard player because uh -huh. you can bend a note with a vibrato on a guitar and it's kind of like a voice. And, wow. it, you know, it's something very expressive. Yeah. And uh, it's an instrument that you can walk around and play. I mean, you know, if you could play trumpet and sing at the same time, you could probably be on every talk show, but <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So, uh, but uh, all I can say is, is that, you know, guitar, I love guitars and I love you guys for uh, 
loving guitars, loving us, loving Tom Petty. And now you can love John Scott and Tom Petty and me. I, wish so I, I just want to kind of wrap this up. And I just want to say, John, I love you. You did the greatest thing for music and for a lot of people because Thank all you. those tunes that mean so much to everybody, they never would have known those tunes if it wasn't for you. So God thank you for doing thank it. You. I want to yeah. let, uh, let you know that, uh, Norm, that my book is available on Amazon and Amazon Kindle. But if you buy it on my site, TomPettyMe.com, I sign every book and I personalize every book if you buy it on TomPettyMe.com. And I think people really like that because it gives it a personal touch. And um, so anyway, so I, I, I'm just excited to be on here with you, to be quite honest with you. I will do a podcast. I would love that. And I wish I could play guitar, though. Well, I wish I could play guitar, too. So, I mean, for a guy who sells them, you know, I'm not far off where you are. So uh, well, you know, you I'm better know. talking about them and selling them than playing them. So. Uh, but anyhow, I want to thank you guys so much from all over the world. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, where all these things are coming in from, Tom Petty Nation, all the people from everywhere um, that are watching this. And, love Tom uh, Petty Nation. I, I can't thank you guys enough. And again, I, I love you all. And uh, please stay with us. You know, if you love Tom, buy that book. And uh, John, thank you again for making the world know who Tom Petty was. Oh, thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, my thrill, my honor. It was my 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 duty. As a all as right, a, likewise, right here. Very good. I owe it to Tom. I owe it to you, and uh, I owe it to Tom Petty Nation and all the people I love. Tom. Tom Petty Thank Nation. You guys. Yeah. Love y'all. Love you too, Norm. Like Thank your you. guitars on the back there. All right. See my. I collect radios. I see. <laughs> you collect guitars. I collect radios too. By the way. Oh, do you really? I do. Oh, wow. Well, that's Cattle, great. A lot of cattle and radios. Oh, I love the uh, the Beta Bakelite. The Bakelite. The Bakelite. Yeah. yeah. Cattle and was like Bakelite, but it was more colorful, actually. Yeah. When you come over to my house, I'll show you some. I've got some. Well, I'll be glad here. to. All right, brother. Anyhow, the great John Scott, Tom Petty, and me. Go out and buy it. Support Tom Petty. Help the Midnight Mission. Love all you guys. And uh, thanks for watching our videos. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, John. You are the man. All right, so John's off, but you're still on. So people are just <laughs> I'm still on. What do you guys want with me? You just talked to the man right there. John, well, what did I say? Uh, what's the rarest guitar here? Uh, uh, well, I've had a lot of very rare guitars. I've had a lot of one-of-a-kind guitars. And I've been blessed that a lot of stuff has come my way over the years. And, uh, you know, thank you guys so much for supporting this store. It's a really rough time. It's a rough time for a lot of people, the manufacturers, um, you know, all the people in the music business, all the people in the restaurant business, um, you know, all the you know, first responders and frontline workers and all that. You know, how can we thank you guys? And again, you know, I've never, never seen a time like this. And again, we, we love you guys. And I, I just hope that you all stay well. And I hope to see you guys again. And thank you, Jen, for putting this together. Jen is responsible for this. So uh, you guys can uh, thank Jen. For oh, my gosh. All right. There's so many people.